Welcome to our sixth meeting of our community of practice for Schoolyard Forests. Um, we are excited to have you all here today. My name is Erica Fine. I'm a senior program manager here at Green Schoolyards America. Um, helping me host today, especially with tech, is Dante Sitolovsky, our communications and program coordinator. Um, we also have a number of other staff who are going to be joining us as speakers today, so we'll introduce them um, when we get there. The agenda for today is that I'll do a brief introduction to this community of practice. We'll share some updates from organization, some new resources. And then today we have um, a couple of speakers again from our own staff. We'll have two sort of sections. The first will be sharing resources from our new schoolyard forest system resource library. Talked about this a little bit at the last community practice, but we wanted to do a deeper dive with you all um, on these resources, especially around the educator resources. Um, and then we'll have a chance for some question and answer about the resources. And then um, after that, um, we wanted to share some examples of schoolyard for us. So we know that we have had some excellent case studies from local school districts in California. Um, and we thought it might help to actually just have some more visuals, some more images of what this can look like um, from all over the country. Um, and I believe probably from other parts of the world as well. So to really, you know, give you that inspiration of what this can really look like. Um, this is our last community of practice uh, for this season. Um, and so we have a little feedback survey we'll share at the end um, and we'll see what time it is. If we have some extra minutes at the end, we'll share and do some networking. If not, we'll have to save that for the next one. Um, so again, by way of introduction, Green School Yards America is a nonprofit based in Berkeley, California. We inspire and support systems change to transform asphalt covered school grounds into living schoolyards that improve children's well being, learning, and play while strengthening their community's ecological health and climate resilience. This community of practice is part of the new um, national schoolyard forest system that we launched last year to help school districts across the country increase tree canopy on their school grounds in places that will directly shade and protect pre-K to 12 students from extreme heat and rising temperatures due to climate change. This community practice is also connected with the California schoolyard forest system, which is the first state in this national initiative. This community of practice is free, open, welcoming monthly discussion. Um, for anybody who's really interested in helping to establish schoolyard forests at scale. And we have a couple of updates um, for you all. The first is that um, this month, May, is Living Schoolyards Month. This annual celebration of school grounds was first established in 2014 as part of a California state resolution that encourages school districts to design and construct schoolyard green spaces and to use them to teach standards-based curriculum. This annual celebration is also intentionally aligned with the International School Grounds Alliance's annual May Festival, which is called the International School Grounds Month. Um, so that right now we have students around the world celebrating their school grounds, which is pretty amazing. Um, we have curated some resources to help you do that. This year, we are especially encouraging folks to explore trees on their school campuses because we're doing this schoolyard forest work. Um, we've uh, curated a selection of resources from our living schoolyard activity guides. Those are free resources available on our website, as well as from our new schoolyard forest system resource library um, and put those into a blog to help you um, find the tree related activities. So we'll put that into the chat for you here. Any way of getting outside is great though, and we'd love to hear about it. If you wanna send us stories or photos, um, that would be lovely. We'd love to love to see them. Um, also I have exciting news about the Living Schoolyards Act. Um, as a reminder, if anybody hasn't heard this already, we've been working closely with the office of Senator Martin Heinrich, Democrat from New Mexico, on a bill to direct federal funds towards transforming schoolyards. It was just reintroduced to Congress last week, um, which is very exciting. Uh, and the thing that we really need now is co-sponsors for the bill. Um, and so if you are somebody who likes calling your representatives and asking them to be involved, um, we are gonna be asking for your help in doing that. We're gonna have some instructions coming out via email next week um, to 
you know, with a script to help you do that, uh, to reach out to your representatives. There are also many other ways of getting involved. We have an amazing group of endorse endorsers right now. I think over 140 organizations um, and individuals have signed on to endorse the bill. If you're interested in doing that, there's more information about how to do that on our website. It's a quick little form um, that, yeah, just takes a minute to sign on to endorse. We are also encouraging folks, uh, especially because it is Living Schoolyards Month, to bring legislators out on tours of schoolyards to show them both great examples of living schoolyards and also the kind of conditions that we're seeking to change. Um, if you have a very hot, barren <laughs> schoolyard and you want to show your legislators why it's important to do this work and to have these, um, these funds available, that is a really powerful way to um, to get them involved. And we have some information about how to plan a schoolyard tour um, that we just put into the chat. It's also on our blog. Uh, and last but not least, there is one more lecture in the lecture series that we've been doing in support of the bill. Um, it's next week on Thursday. And the topic is schoolyard design, green infrastructure, and green building standards. And we always have um, an amazing set of speakers that are involved in those series. So I encourage you to check that out. Okay, and with that, um, we get to our first set of speakers. So um, again, this first section is gonna be about the resources in our new Squared Forest system. Um, we will have a Q&A after this section. So if you have questions that come up while they're talking, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and I'm gonna introduce the folks from our staff. We're gonna be leading this section. Aisha Ersalan is our education specialist here at Green Squares America. She has taught and developed environmental education curriculum in school gardens for more than 20 years, working in both public and private schools. She's also trained teachers through the San Francisco Green Schoolyards Alliance, Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, and San Francisco Eco Literacy Conferences. She pursued a master's degree in ecosystem science and management from the Yale School of the Environment. An ecosystem perspective continues to deeply inform her thinking. Rachel Pringle is our Director of Operations and Strategy here at Green Squares America. She has been working in the environmental education and green schoolyards fields for over 20 years. In that time, Rachel's led and supported various programs and projects. Most recently, she helped found and grow Education Outside, a nonprofit that brought science and environmental literacy to life in over 60 schoolyards throughout the Bay Area. She was also an an environmental educator and taught in public school garden for four years. Rachel's co-author of How to Grow a School Garden, a complete guide for parents and teachers. And I'm going to hand it over to them. Thank you, Erica, so much. And, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here today. We're going to give um, a quick overview of some of the resources we've put together um, in the last um, in the last few months, uh, supporting schoolyard forests around the state. And we wanted to show um, our website and our, our forest library. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I will do a quick intro to the forest library and then hand it over to Aisha who will dive deeper into um, our educator resources. Um, so I am hopefully sharing now. Um, so welcome to our uh, Schoolyard Forest Resource Library. We made this live just last month and it will, we're gonna continually be updating this library and adding resources as we go. But um, we wanted to share this to make sure that everyone knows these resources are here and avails themselves of these resources, whether they're in schools or districts or uh, nonprofits that are supporting schools in planting trees. Um, we have, this is our, um, Forest System Resource Library landing page. And we have three main toolkits um, that we've published for, for folks. And they're listed here. And the first one is around making the case for schoolyard forests, the rationale, if you will. Um, the second one is design, implementation, and maintenance of schoolyard forests. And the last is schoolyard forest educator resources. All three of these toolkits can be found in our main navigation right up here at the top, one, two, and three. We also have links here to funding sources for schoolyard forest um, forests, as well as the link to the community of practice, which you're now um, participating in and will continue again in the fall, and um, some links to schoolyard forests in the news. <clears throat> so I will share briefly today a little bit about um, making the case for schoolyard forests. And this, this page is really for um, 
as I said, schools, school districts, and, um, and folks trying to share the rationale for why Scleared Forests really are a great, um, a, a great project and a great uh, response to climate change and urban heat island. Um, and um, we'll be adding resources, I said, to this as we go along, but we've, we talk here about surface temperature studies on schoolyards, um, <clears throat> as well as um, we've sharing some of our preliminary results for mapping tree canopy equity, which is um, a term that we're really using right now to talk about um, the, uh, the disparities between um, uh, schoolyards and, um, and how they shade children or not shade children. And um, so we're doing some research here and we'll be sharing more of that research here as we go. In particular, I wanted to highlight this resource here, Taking Squared Forest to Scale. This is our, um, the result of our focus groups that we've um, conducted over the last year or so around um, the challenges and opportunities for planting squared forests. Um, and this uh, white paper really um, uh, summarizes our findings from um, those focus groups and reports on existing challenges that impede implementation, as well as opportunities that could be harnessed to improve schoolyard greening and schoolyard forest policy and practice at the lo local and state levels. Um, so this is, uh, we also have links here to the benefits of schoolyard forests. Um, so, you know, whether you're, again, a teacher or a district leader, leadership that needs to understand why these, why these spaces and why schoolyard forests are really so beneficial to school communities and students in particular, there's some um, information here. We also have links here to our community of practice and many of the many uh, wonderful speakers that we've been able to hear this, um, this year so far and their testimony. So that is the first uh, toolkit. The second toolkit we have is around um, design, implementation, and maintenance of schoolyard forests. Um, and here we call it getting started, creating and sustaining a schoolyard forest. Um, we, uh, again, many resources will be um, published by June, we're hoping, um, here. So we have a, a resource coming soon around design, implementation, and best practices, best practices around design and implementation of schoolyard forests. Um, we have uh, our uh, guide to selecting trees, what we're calling our California Regional Planting Palette. Um, so if you're familiar with landscape architecture term, terminology, palette is really a, a selection of plants. Um, uh, and we've curated this with support from various entities. Um, and I'll share this a little bit more about this in just a second. We also have some planting guidance that has already been written by um, CAL FIRE for folks who want to plant trees and, and how to do that well. Um, and we'll be having, uh, we'll be publishing um, a document here around best practices for school communities and maintenance staff. Because um, obviously we know maintenance is a big issue for any sort of living space on schoolyards. That document will be coming soon. So just to share really quickly, this California um, regional planting palette, this document um, is really um, a big table of, of trees um, that are selected for various, um, with various, uh, for various reasons. And they've been listed out and all of the factors are listed, to their, it listed in the tree palette and you can um, search for your sunset zone wherever you are in California. And then you can, um, by your sunset zone, find the appropriate tree palette. And this is really to help support selection of trees that are appropriate for your schoolyard. Um, and we've also put a big emphasis in this tree palette on climate adaptability. So as we know, our climate is shifting in California and everywhere. Um, this palette has, has, been, has taken that into account. So, um, to go back to our original landing page for the forest system, as I mentioned, we have three toolkits. I've just gone briefly over the first two. Um, more resources will be added to those very soon. But I'm going to hand it over now to um, my colleague Aisha, who will go over the School Yard Forest Educator Resources, which she has put together. All right. So just to show where everybody where this is again and where the piece Rachel was showing, it's under Resources. And here's our School Yard Forest System Library. Um, so she was just showing you pieces from within that. And I'd like to walk you through what we put together for educators. I'm going to do a quick overview and then dive deep into a few segments of it. So you get a closer look at it. This was put together for preschool through 12th grade. Um, 
because all students of all ages can be involved in their schoolyard and includes a lot of standards based lessons um, to involve the students. So let's see. So we divided this initially into a section called preparing for planting if you don't have a schoolyard forest yet, uh, this, which has been, you know, our primary target and what my teachers do with their students uh, as they start thinking about this. Um, how cool is your schoolyard is uh, one of our flagship resources that's going to be coming out within the next few weeks. So keep an eye out for that. And that is a resource on uh, students measuring surface temperatures and directly understanding urban heat island and as well as themselves understanding what some of the solutions are and proposing that uh, after they've collected data. And there's other resources under preparing for planting. Um, teachers can do a brainstorm about the different uh, benefits of trees and appreciating trees. They can engage students in the design right from the beginning. They can do research on specific trees in that palette that Rachel was just talking about. Um, and of course, tips on how to prepare your students for preparing tree, uh, planting trees, what needs to be done, what do you do if uh, planning for getting dirty and wet and all those good things that happen on the actual day. Um, and just to back up, a lot of this is uh, resources we've gathered from you know, organizations and schools that have been doing this for years and are so experienced in this and we're just sort of highlighting best practices out there. Uh, after you have planted, hmm, now what, right? The work is not done. Uh, you adopt a tree is a short collection of activities um, for teachers who just want to do a short follow-up. They can make signs and displays. Here's a resource with all kinds of different ways to do that. They can set up permanent photo monitoring and really track their forests through the years. The other way to get involved after you've planted the trees is engaging students in stewardship, of course, and rather than just leaving it to the adults. Uh, and it's so powerful if they themselves take on the responsibility. So we have resources on what those tasks might be, as well as some lessons. I'm actually going to come back to this in a minute, just showing you again a really much deeper dive. Um, this section is created both for schools who are just starting to plant trees, where, as well as schools that already have trees or full canopies on campus or even trees nearby, and is all the, divided by all the grade bands. And we also so far have a resource on connecting this to citizen science projects that are happening locally, nationally, or even globally. So what I would like to do is I'm going to scroll back up and just drop into a few of these. Um, let's see, I want to real quick. Engaging students in design. Um, this can be as young as preschool by interviewing the students. Um, there's a variety of ways uh, they can start analyzing their schoolyard, mapping it, uh, connecting to social studies in all sorts of ways, science microclimate. Uh, studies. So we have put in a bunch of links uh, of resources of lessons that are already out there. Um, they can research their community, they can research the trees, they can calculate materials. Anyway, um, they can propose just a glimpse at that. And then the beautiful thing is, let me see, we've got a video gallery of design ideas for students who don't have the chance to go see something. Uh, photos are worth a million words as always. So this is a design gallery of many schools that have already done so. And we will keep adding to this to inspire and inform students as well as their um, teaching community. If we go back to the main page. After engaging students in design and planting, I want to show you adopt a tree real quick. And really, I'm seeing this as a sort of a short collection of activities uh, for teachers just starting to dip their toe in, perhaps, into teaching outside. And this is a collection of activities that addresses math standards, science standards, language arts, as well as, as, well as visual arts. And we'll be having a guide to specific standards coming out in a couple of months as well. 
um, but just you'll see how we've organized it. This is our standard format. We have a link. We have the organization. Beatles is out of the Lawrence Hall of Science. We have a short write-up. And in this case, we have shown you which grade levels it's most appropriate to. And as any experienced teacher knows, many things are very adaptable uh, one way or the other. So that's adopt a tree. It's a list of resources. If I go back to the main page, engaging students in stewardship, the stewardship tasks actually breaks down the main tasks that tend to need to be done. Uh, whether it's watering, weeding, mulching, raking up those leaves, pruning, or monitoring tree health over time. One of our audience members helped review that. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, this has various tips for how you might do this with students, as well as some of the technical. But this isn't this isn't the piece for the facility staff. This is for the teachers or maybe even adult volunteers who might be taking a group of kids after school, summer school, or during the school day. And what are some things to know if you haven't done this before? Go back. And we know that we need to keep academics right there front and center. There are so many lessons that can be tied in. We've created this resource by grade band. Again, this was under stewardship lessons. Uh, to keep it connected, um, if I choose grades K-5, for example, just um, again, we have um, our little table of contents and imagine you, a group is watering and that's what that classroom has taken on. They could potentially study leaf veins and how plant structure and function for how water moves within a plant. They might do a role play with build a tree and do some kinesthetic activity that way. They could study leaf transpiration. Um, you get the idea. We've similarly put together some resources. If you're doing weeding, use those weeds um, or mulching, etc. If I go back that was stewardship, where am I? And finally, I just want to show you, this was our really deep dive as we call it. Um, or I really wanna keep doing puns like branching out and, and digging deeper, things like that. But if I choose a grade band here, six, eight, for example, you will see that we have tried to pull together um, resources on the main academic disciplines. I mean, the forests and living schoolyards are a beautiful place to bring together all the disciplines. There's a lot of experience out there already. And so we have just put together uh, what, what um, other people have written up and put them together here. So we've got science, math, language arts, social science, visual art and performing arts, social emotional learning, and PE, and for the younger kids, uh, this table of contents includes nature play, because how could we leave that out? So just for example, I can click down to science, and we have plant structure and function, some ideas. Again, we have a link to an actual activity, the organization or the individuals who put it together. Um, we have materials on ecosystems because once you've planted a schoolyard forest, you all of a sudden have an ecosystem at whatever scale you wanna think around just one tree or the whole grove of trees, whether you're thinking about the other species that come and start using it, the insects, uh, the soil, what's happening with water collection. Um, so there's a few ideas there. And, uh, and then, um, some sample lessons to think about the carbon cycle and climate climate literacy as well. Um, we have one on carbon sequestration in trees and how to do some calculations on that. I will go back to the main page and I will leave it at that. And again, that was under resources, schoolyard forest system library, and within the forest system library, you can access educator resources here or down through here. Amazing. Aisha, thank you so much for walking us through all of those, um, for all the work that you've done on curating those resources and getting them on the website. I see some folks popping into the chat 
um, appreciation for, for this list of resources. Um, we have a couple minutes uh, here. If folks have questions about any of the resources that you've seen, we're happy to answer questions. Um, best way to do that is to put your question in the chat. So we'll hang out for a minute and see if there's any questions we can answer about these resources. Um, and again, there, there are more coming soon, um, both in the uh, category of resources for educators and for students, and also in the other categories that Rachel shared at the beginning about um, design and implementation and making the case. I know that's a set of questions that we've often heard in this community of practice is folks wanting help um, making the case for school yard forests. Um, so there's more resources coming there soon. Um, I see a question if we're planning to make this available in any other language. Um, I can say I don't know that we have immediate plans to do that. There are a couple individual resources um, that are available in Spanish, at least right now. Um, and Chinese. We would love to do that. There's a few in Chinese by. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it sounds like some individual resources. Um, we would love to be able to make more of it available in more languages. Um, folks want to work with us on that let us know. Um, I should say specifically, um, if you're specifically looking for activities for children, um, we have a, a different, slightly older set of resources called the Living Schoolers Activity Guides, and those have been translated into a couple more languages, um, and we can share a link to those resources as well. Um, ah, Sharon put that in the chat, yep. Um, are we planning to have kids clubs like eco ambassadors. Um, it's not something that we are would be um, sort of planning or launching ourselves, but that is a fantastic way to do some of this work. Um, schoolyards need care all year long. So if that's an after school club or that's a summer activity, uh, we certainly believe that that's a great structure to use. Um, but yeah, it won't be something that we will be populating the world with. <laughs> um, Sharon said not yet. Um, yeah, any other questions about these activities and resources? We know there's a lot of them. We encourage you to take your time looking through them. Is there a single page or a couple slides we'd recommend you focus on when introducing this to families? This is a lot of information. It can be overwhelming wondering where to start. Um, that is an excellent question. Aisha, do you have any thoughts about that? And um, Sharon, you're also welcome to hop in here too. Well, yeah, the, Sharon. The kickoff video for um, the recording for the, the community of practice, um, that the very first one had, it's not a two page or a one pager, but it had a, 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 a brief presentation about the rationale for why we're doing the community of practice and what what is the, the purpose of the National Schoolyard Forest System. Um, and the California Schoolyard Forest System, and so those those included, and in, as do the pages for those um, on the website for those two uh, uh, programs. But we'll be putting more in the rationale section in a in a e more easily shareable format. Yeah. Um, thanks. Is there anything you want to add to that? Nope. Um, and we'll see this one last question about uh, oh, case building. I might add one thing. I I would say sort of one thing, just even, you know, Sharon's going to show things. And also if they just wanted to inspire parents, families, the, the, the resource I mentioned in design, engaging students in design that has a photo gallery at the bottom, that could be something to show, like, this is what's possible. And this is what other schools have done. Um, Thanks. Um, yeah, it's a great suggestion. And then uh, the last question we'll take for now is this question about um, uh, case resources specific to health and wellness in the garden. The link I'm going to pop in the chat is from um, our first go around um, of providing resources to the to the world that we was came out of COVID. And so some of the language in this link is a little bit COVID specific, but we do have um, a resource that has lots of links about the health benefits um, to 
green schoolyards and living schoolyards and getting kids outside. So I just popped that in the chat. Um, and in the coming months, we plan to um, sort of update some of that language um, to help you use it in, in any moment. Um, but yeah, that should be a good starting place. All right. And with that, um, we're going to say thank you to Aisha and Rachel, uh, who was here with us as well. Um, and we're going to hop over to Sharon. Um, our next speaker is our very own Sharon Diggs. Sharon is the CEO and founder of Green Squares America. She is an environmental city planner, schoolyard designer, and researcher who's worked to build and shape the green schoolyards field for more than 20 years. Her work is driven by a sense of urgency to improve equitable access to green space and protect children from the increasing effects of climate change. She is an Ashoka Fellow, a co-founder of the International School Grounds Alliance, and author of the book Asphalt to Ecosystems, Design Ideas for Schoolyard Transformation, which I should add, I saw Sharon post on LinkedIn, there is a discount on that book right now from the publisher because of Living Schoolyards Month and celebration of Living Schoolyards Month. So if that is a resource that you're interested in, um, the Maybe we can find the code and pop in the chat, but I know it's it's on her LinkedIn. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Sharon. Um, again, there will be some time for Q&A after this. So if you have questions as we go, feel free to pop them in the chat. Thanks so much, Erica. It's lovely to be here with you all again today. And um, I'm happy to, to help bookend um, this community of practice for the spring session of the community of practice at the in the opening session. The talk it gave focused on the rationale and kind of the problems with inequity. Um, and there were a lot of numbers and and um, a lot of of things that spur our work and are very important to talk about. But I, I thought I would take the time on the on the other side of this um, lecture series to, to inspire and look at things that uh, share with you things that have inspired me over the years and um, just take a look at what schoolyard forests are and can be around the world. Um, and uh, oops, can you go back to the first one? Thanks. First one. I'm not there yet. <laughs> Sorry. So um, the things that I've I've had the opportunity to travel in the last 20 years um, to many different countries looking at school grounds. And um, so what I brought you today are some slides that are my favorite, like little snippets of forests that are, um, keep in mind while you're looking at these pictures, which are lovely, that they're not necessarily common in their area either. I went to the sites because they were exceptional and special places, and I also am showing you the places I like the best on the site. So every school is struggling to move ahead um, and to do the best that they can. And But these are, are, in my mind, some of the goals we might head, head to and try to create more places like this as far around the world as we can where we are. Um, okay, and so next slide. Um, and so just to start off, I, I thought I would also just touch on the definition of what are kind of what are schoolyard forests as the, the National Schoolyard Forest System and the California Schoolyard Forest System are, are working, working toward. We are, um, with our programming, looking at schoolyard forests as climate oases on school campuses that are designed to nurture and protect students from extreme heat. So we really want to put the shade where the kids are in big groves so that kids can take shelter in them when it's warm outside or extremely hot. Um, and we want to be planting those, as Aisha was saying, with climate adapted tree planting pallets. So the trees will live now and also in a hundred years um, that when the climate has shifted, we want to be able to uh, make sure that children's activities get shaded. So I'm gonna show you slides of outdoor learning and physical activity and social gathering and play space. We think that this can be done at all different schools of all different sizes in all different climates. And so I've, I've thrown a mix of those into the slideshow too. And um, as we were talking about, as Aisha was mentioning, um, it's really important to involve students in the design, planting, stewardship, and use of grounds um, so that they have an opportunity to be change makers um, and, and see which part of this, um, how, how they can be helpers and change the world for the better. So next. So I'm just going to start with small groves. Um, plantings don't necessarily need to be huge to shade children. And well-placed plants are like this, even a huge bush is a great spot for kids to just get under and get out of the sun. Next. Here's a small grove in a schoolyard in Oregon, um, sheltering some tables for classes and other uses. Next. And one in California that this little grove here next to the building makes a huge difference to the temperature um, as compared to the heat on the playground adjacent. Next. 
this little grove is a great place to have, you can see, have a class on a hot day or also next. And this small grove um, in Illinois is uh, just a few please, trees planted in the child accessible part of the playground that gives kids another option to just get out of the sun on a hot day. Next. This space, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's really hard to imagine that a forest could be a, a, something that kids can use on a site as small as this one. This one was designed by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Ko Senda. It's in Yokohama, Japan. And it is a, a tiny site that that office kind of shaped building is on a steep hillside and it the whole preschool yard is what you're looking at. But he designed this incredible structure that makes use of that forest. Next. Um, that uh, kids on the top left, there's a place, a play structure connected to the building that is the exit from the building down into the yard. Um, next, and you, you enter at the tree canopy level um, through that net, go down a tunnel um, and into the play forest. And then jumping um, across to Sweden, next, um, where um, this idea of, of if your school is lucky enough to have trees, protect them, use them, um, start there and celebrate the trees that you have. So this is a schoolyard in Sweden that looks to me like it's really celebrating the trees that they have. Next. Uh, it's, it's a preschool yard that has all kinds of things to do with, with structures just tucked into the trees. Next. Another schoolyard in Sweden um, with also with great trees. Some that they've planted, they look like they're planted around the buildings and they're the buildings are nestled into them, but they definitely have looked look like they this was something that was planted for this preschool. Next. Next. Same school, same school, lovely little areas tucked into trees. Next. And then they also, this is the same school, created some spaces. Now these trees in the middle there are not very high. We would call them bushes, but if you're a preschooler, they look like trees and they are making a, a special place for kids in the center. If you go next that if you're a toddler, it looks like this when you get inside. So it's a place to have a playhouse and the adults can see through the bottom and see the feet of the kids inside. Next. And um, Germany and Sweden both do a lot of creating of spaces at preschools and elementary schools with willow trees like these that let have semi-permeable, um, sometimes more see-through if they when they get around to pruning it, um, you know, for supervision, but it's a it's a great spot for kids to um, have a playhouse or a fort. Next. And then there are play forests where the forests are designed for play. Next. Um, I see a lot of this in Japan and in Sweden. Next. Here's an example of a hillside slide through a forest at a preschool in Japan. And other trees situated around and, and among um, play custom built play structures for this elementary school in the Tokyo area. Next. Um, and a spectacular um, play structure through a, a forest at a preschool in, I think, Yokohama. Next. And another view of that site. And this lovely spot is um, in Virginia, was designed by Green Schoolyards America's uh, staff member, Nancy Strinisty. Beautiful little preschool playhouses. Next. An example of another um, forest patch school at Oregon. And then learning forests. How do you set them up to have outdoor classroom spaces and hands-on activities to learn from and with trees? Here's one example from England. Next. One from Virginia where the library program comes outside and is, is, is outside through the murals and the chairs and the adjacency of the library itself. Next. And shady spots here, another school in Virginia. And then we've flown over to Bali, Indonesia to look at the high school using doing science lab outside, right outside their classroom, um, hands on botany and other science experiments. Next. And another shot of those students. Um, and then we have forests designed to be food forests, so producing. Food. This is at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley, where there are fig trees and other fruit trees that um, not only provide shade, but also provide a lot of food. Next. Uh, there's another shot of, of the figs and I think some olives. Next. 
And this one is another food forest, but it's in Vietnam. And they have, of course, tropical trees with um, papaya and uh, I think durian and some other things growing in the background. Next. Bananas too. Next. This one in Thailand, I think those are papayas um, growing in a little, little grove. They're not quite so shady, but I think those are pretty young trees. Next. And then looking at biodiversity forests, we have all different ways to add a biodiverse forest uh, in our canopy. This particular school in Virginia was looking at, at calling that out and using it for their science curriculum. So they have signage, next. That looks like this. And they, they have planted lots of different species of different kinds and, and some were naturally occurring too, I think. With outdoor classroom space, it's there. This one in Colorado um, is a, a wetland, a school that built a wetland half on their property, half on the park, and all around it are all the different habitat types in Colorado are represented in patches around this this uh, this wetland, and so they have all different kinds of trees and uh, forests around the wetland. Next. Here's another biodiversity forest in Taiwan um, with all kinds of of uh, wonderful plants and trees that run through a half public, half um, public school space with a creek running down the middle. Next. Here's another shot of that space and what students have access to. And now jumping into forest being used and ca tree canopy being used for climate adaptation and cooling the landscape. This is um, a shot of an elementary school in New Mexico that has made some Good decisions about minimizing their asphalt so they don't have so much heat happening there and adding shade trees in places that children can access them uh, during the school day adjacent to their ball play. Next. Another school in New Mexico doing a nice job of providing shade where their outdoor classrooms are. So you can do it even in really hot, really dry climates. Just have to have the right trees. Next. Example from Illinois, where their front yard trees are being used for were being used for an assembly during the pandemic, um, music, uh, music assembly, I believe. But the shade trees providing cooling for that, and and kind of nice backdrop and a coziness um, for that performance. Next, and also in the same city, um, more more uh, yard being cooled by the landscape. Although there, I, I think that those are the benches for the supervisors rather than the areas that the kids are most likely to be in, so it'd be good to add even more, but I, they're going in a great direction. Next, you can see all the baby trees in the background, some more cooling landscape next to the building to make the space people walk around the building uh, cooler and around the perimeters. It'd be nice to see some over the place structures too. Next. And then here's a climate adapted, adapted cooling landscape in uh, Bali, Indonesia, where they have indoor outdoor spaces a lot and the plants come right up to the building and, and shade and cool the interior of the spaces that are used at the outside outdoor but covered spaces. Next. So you can do it in hot and wet climates as well. Here's the front yard of that school. Next. And then over in Taiwan, um, similarly putting trees wherever the active, active use spaces are not so that you get shade um, both over and near the ball play, but also as you're walking around the site. Next. And uh, one of the side yards along the front of a school in Taipei. So if you, if this is a very urban school in Taipei. So if you can do it in Taipei and places like Tokyo and New York City, we can also do it in our cities um, closer to, you know, across the country. Next. Um, and this is also in um, Taipei or maybe Tainan, a big city though, in Taiwan, uh, where they've got extensive shade at this school, next. Again, same school, different side, next. Shaded play space to cool for the purpose of cooling the play area, next. Um, and more, um, more of the main pathways people walk and bike being shaded in Thailand at a school, next. And then in Germany, they, they um, 40 years ago, unpaved about 400 schoolyards, um, trying to get all of the stormwater to soak in that fell on every site. And, and as a result, they shaped the ground, they planted trees. We'll do a whole nother presentation about this incredible work in Berlin in another, in the future. But suffice to say, this was a paved schoolyard about 30 years ago. And now it is a lush, amazingly uh, fabulous forest and it absorbs all the stormwater. Um, next. And another example from Berlin, Similarly, previously asphalt. Next. Also from Berlin, same story. 
Um, so it, it is possible. It's good to see where it goes after you plant it. It takes a while to get from small to big, but it's worth it's worth the journey. Next. And then I'd say um, this is a school, I think that's called Elm Place. So it's part of the identity. And in the front of the school, there's a ton of trees. And so the public face of the school and, and the use of, the, of some of the grounds are to be outside under the canopy. And I think that is interesting to incorporate it in the identity of the school. Next. And then uh, this one is a school in a forest rather than a forest in a school. It's got, as you, it's in Taiwan, in, in Tainan, a big city. Um, and as you come into the school, you, you are greeted by the forest, which wraps around and goes through the whole site. Next. And here's a shot from the interior of the school site. Next. And um, this is a picture that's really rare. I think there aren't that many places in the US where we've really tried to shade our asphalt hardscape. And so I think this is a great example of that um, in a climate as hot and humid as Taiwan. It's really important to have the shade and they've done it. So it is possible. Um, we just need to, to figure out how to, um, how to make it work in our uh, codes and uh, maybe more our attitudes. <laughs> but it seems like a really nice place to be while you're playing ball because you want to be cool while you're playing ball too. Next. And this is also on the same site. They have this amazing, dense planted, interesting, aesthetic um, play forest. Yeah, next. And so just concluding here, uh, the importance of involving kids in um, all aspects of creating a schoolyard forest, starting with research. And so when our How Cool Is Your Schoolyard activity comes out, we'll have step-by-step -step directions about this, how you might go about figuring out which areas of your grounds are the hottest. And then next. Um, involving kids in the design process to think about um, what should go where on their schoolyard, what they would really like to see. Um, and next, um, engaging them in planting. This is a, a cool Milwaukee forest being planted in Berkeley, California. Next. And in the stewardship of taking care of the plants that are put in. Um, and, I, and also in the use of these environments afterward. I don't think I have a, a use slide after that. Um, and so I, I think it's, to me, this is, it's important to involve the children for many reasons, it's curriculum tied, but it's, it's also something that embodies hope in this very depressing you know, time where we're worried about climate crisis and things going haywire. You know, people ask, how can you help? And if you're a student, you can help in these ways. You can, you can get involved. You can help your school to think about where trees are most needed to identify them, to help put them in and to, to help um, watch the trees grow and nurture them as they grow and see that you can make a difference in your own area. I think everybody should just, um, the goal is to do what you can where you are. And for students, it, this is their school grounds are their place where they can be change makers. And so next, please. And so this image, um, shout out to Robin Moore, who's in the audience today, designed by Robin and the school community in Berkeley at Washington Elementary. And this is a 50 year old child planted forest designed and built in the seventies with the help of students. And some of those students have grown up to be parents of students who were there when I um, visited the school a while back. And it's exciting to, they remembered the, the planting of this project. And, um, and so this is one of our models as we think about what, what schoolyard forest should, would we love to see more schools have? This is a great patch here. Um, and a great example. Children can be change makers. Next. So what can you do? You can help protect what you have on site and use it. You can try to keep construction equipment away from the roots and, and defend the trees that you have when things happen. Uh, let students access the trees. Sometimes they're cordoned off at the side. Um, try to find a way that they can get to them. Diversify the uses of the outdoor space um, so that you can do more things besides learning. Learning is super important, but also play and biodiversity and climate adaptation. Um, plant more trees if you don't have any or if you need more. Um, best time to plant a tree was always, you know, years ago, but the second best time is now. So start planting when you can as when you have thought it out and engage students in all aspects of research, design, planting, and stewardship. I think that's it. Thank you all. Thank you, Sharon, so much for giving us that amazing overview um, and all of the inspiration um, to do this work. Um, we do have some time now for some questions and I've been tracking. Um, there's been some 
uh, in the chat as we've been going. Sharon, I saw a couple questions asking uh, for names of some of the amazing schools. Um, I don't know if that's something that you have access to, but uh, if it is, maybe something people can communicate some with. Some of them. I also, uh, I, I, they, I always have permission when I'm taking the pictures, but I didn't tell them I'm going to like send people to hound them. So I feel I don't always put it in the slide if I haven't haven't made sure of that in ahead of time. But um, if there are particular questions, I might be able to answer that. Yeah. Um, let's see. There was a question. I think it was about the uh, school in Japan um, with K Kosenda's school. Do you have mm -hmm. the name of that one? Cool. We can figure it out. Yeah. I, it. Yeah. I can find Hello. it. <laughs> Um, I saw there was a comment here about um, uh, um, Robin's organization, Natural Learning Initiative, am I getting it right? Um, the use of sort of videos uh, to help make the case for this kind of work. Um, I love that that resource is, it's something that we would love to do more of in our own organization. Um, so yes, yes to videos. Um, I don't, th this person was asking about a virtual green schoolyard field trip. Um, it's not something that I know of right now, but we would love to help create that. Well, in a way, our, our community of practice usually is is that we have when we invite school districts out to talk about their work. So if you haven't had a chance to come to the previous sessions, there are a bunch of recordings of school district colleagues giving their tours of, of their own sites. But we hope to do more of that in, around the country in the future, too. Um, there's a question here about uh, what groups or organizations are sponsoring the development of outdoor environmental activities and areas for schools? I have some thoughts about that, in, in particularly in California, Sharon, but I wonder if you want to respond to that. No, go, go ahead. I just wanted to, you know, give a shout out to our partners in California, um, 10 Strands and the California Department of Education and CAL FIRE here have been um, partners in us launching the California Schoolyard Forest System um, and directing a lot of funding towards uh, the work that we're doing to support schoolyard forests in California and expanding at scale. So those are some amazing entities that are supporting the work in California. Um, and oh my God, I mean, the ecosystem of you all, of non you know nonprofit partners and schools that are helping to create activities is extensive you'll see a lot of the names as you go through the activities and the resource pages that i just showed um at the beginning of today again like all i just wrote some amazing activities <laughs> some of them come from us but most of them the large majority of those activities and resources come from organizations in this community and everybody is credited um so if you scroll through you'll see the names of all the organizations that are involved in this kind of work um, and, and there are also at the back of the the living schoolyard activity guide um, on those on those activity guide pages, we wrote the books both to share the activities and to to create a directory of organizations doing this work in the U.S. and around the world. And there are two guides. One one is in the U.S. US authors, and the other one is international authors. And if you flip to the back, there are maps with um, websites and lists of organizations that do this work. And I think also our living schoolyard. Act um, endorser list has is up right with logos yeah. of the people who the organizations that have endorsed that many of whom are also on the same page are about this. Yeah. So. Um, Sharon, I think you like this question. Um, so we ask, is there a tool to measure the schoolyard and determine um, thirty percent to be planted in tree canopy? So how do we determine what maybe percent of our schoolyard is currently shaded? Um, what you know, if we are trying to get towards a certain number, how do we do that kind of measurement? Indeed, we have, we have, um, we are in the midst of doing some mapping. And, and if you're in California, we will have some of those numbers for you soon. Um, but we also, I don't, you can use Google Earth if you're just doing one site um, and outline the tree, outline the, the school site, and it has a measuring tool and write down the number. And then you can outline the trees and write down the number for the area. And that's that was the first way that we did some of that research a while back, and it's a little slow, but definitely possible and free um, uh, for a single site. So it's it's good to look at. And maybe in a future a future talk, we can look at um, we've been we've been looking at the numbers and the placement of trees too, and how it uh, how they feel when you put them in. When you put trees along the edges, you don't really feel their presence quite as much as if it takes up space in the middle. Um, you can see them from other places. So it's both about percent and student access and kind of visual access to the trees. Um, but from a shading perspective and a cooling perspective, you want the biggest trees with the widest canopy 
over the most area where the kids are. And the 30% was a number that the UN is aiming at for cities in general. And we figured kids should have what cities have. And so that is a whole property number. And you figure a third of the property is usually the building and the other two thirds of the ground. So we're really talking about half the grounds and the half, the, like one third, one third of the grounds be green, one third of the grounds be sports and other things, and one third of the grounds be buildings. Um, and so the the third that with the tree canopy, we're hoping schools will put the new trees in, in the part of the grounds that will shade the children during the school. Um, we are almost at time, but there's one other question I want to address because I know we've talked about it internally. Um, there's a question about our, uh, or a comment about the tree pallets. Um, feeling like it'd be great to have resources on native stuff rather than exotic or aesthetically pleasing yeah. trees. We've definitely thought a lot about what uh, we and the partners that we've worked with thought a lot about what trees have gone into the tree pallets um, and what haven't and definitely, you know, taking into mind a whole range of um, criteria about what trees go in there. Sharon, I don't know if you want to speak to that. More. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really important. And, and we would love to see lists like this around the country. We have not seen too many others yet. Um, the idea that that the climate in 2100 is different than the climate we have now, right? So what we think of as native plants to our place may not grow here in 2100, right? Wherever here is for you. So when we talk about native plants, I think what we're also talking about is trying to assist the forest with migrating north or whichever direction it needs to stay in its climate zone. Right. So what we think of as our local native plants, if you're putting in trees and they're going to last 100 years, are the trees that are both things that will grow well now and things that will grow well later. And that's what our palette is about. It's got that in it. Um, thank you, Doug, for the thumbs up. And so, so the, uh, you know, I think it's, it, you can't, it's not as simple as native plants. Native plants are shifting. That's the, I think that's part of the answer. Yeah. And so it's biodiversity and seed source variety and all these other things we can do to help the forests move where they need to move um, as the Bay Area becomes Los Angeles and Los Angeles becomes Phoenix, you know, the tree pallets shift. So things like that, I'm sure it's different in your regions too, but we need to prepare for it and we're working yeah. on it and we would love your help. Yeah, thank you, Sharon, for adding that. Um, and uh, thank you all for all of your questions um, and your engagement in this whole series. Um, we uh, are gonna wrap up now. We do hope to be back with you, plan to be back with you in the fall. So please um, keep an eye out for emails uh, and social media for our next round of um, community practice um, and bringing folks together. We do have a um, survey for you all um, that uh, just went into the chat. It says, please fill out our survey. Um, maybe I'll pop it in. Oh, great. Dante put it in there a couple of times. We would love to hear your feedback on this series, on the format, on the content, um, on what you'd like to learn about next so that um, when we get to developing the next one, uh, we can incorporate all of your feedback. Thank you so much to all of our guest speakers um, today, our, our own staff and everybody who's contributed over this whole six session series. We've had some amazing um, folks present and, and just like such amazing detail that I know is really helpful to the people who attended. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, yeah, we're very glad to have you. The recording will be up in the next week or two. Um, Feel free to let us know if you have questions. We look forward to being in community with you all as we move forward with this work. Thank you everyone very much.